Now, Albert Einstein had a quote. He said, imagination is everything. It's the preview to life's coming attractions. This is important information. But let me tell you where Albert Einstein got that paraphrase from. He got it out the Bible because it's actually a scripture. But it's a scripture that's never explained to you the right way. When I learned it, it changed my life. Now, it's a scripture that you've all heard. It says faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. All faith is, really, the substance of it is just what you hope for. That's all faith is. It's just real hard hoping. You remember when you was little and you said, I hope I get a bike for Christmas? And you went out there one year and a bike was under the tree? You remember when you said you hope you graduate and you mess around and got a diploma? <laughs> then you remember when you said you hope you get a job and you mess around and you got a job? Huh? At one point in time, the older you get, this got to start clicking in. That faith is really the substance of things hoped for. That if you hope hard enough, one day you ought to get smart and turn all that hoping into belief. And what is belief? Nothing but faith. And what is faith? Faith is a belief in things that you cannot see. When you ain't seen no way you was going to get a job, he got you one, didn't he? When you ain't seen no way you was going to get that bike, he got you one, didn't he? When you ain't think you was going to graduate, you graduated, didn't he? That's because God was turning your hopes into faith. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. That's the beginning of it. Now, hit a kicker. This is the part you got to get. And the evidence of things not seen. Uh-oh. See, this is what the part you got to get. The evidence of things not seen. Remember I told you that imagination is everything. It's the preview to life's coming attraction. Man, do you know, but do you, Lord, now let me tell you the problem with your imagination. Problem with your imagination is you tell it to the wrong people. If you want to kill a big dream, tell it to a small-minded person. Do you know how many times God has showed you something in your imagination that you knew was just for you? You were so excited when he came to you, you went and you shared it with your family and friends. You know what they did? They shot it down. You know why they shot it down? Because they couldn't see it. You know why they couldn't see it? Because God didn't show it to them. He showed it to you. He showed you the evidence of things not seen. See, they might love you, but they don't know what God going to do for you. My teacher thought she was sparing me. Take your stupid self up there and try to audition for TV with this stuttering problem. She thought she was saving me. She might have even meant well. But she didn't know though. See, your mom and them, your cousin and them, your friends, they don't know. See, you got to be careful when you share your imagination with small-minded people. Nobody else can see your imagination but you. But see, it ain't just you imagining stuff. It's your God showing you a preview of a coming attraction that he has for you. I'm going to share something with you. I'm going to tell you something that every successful person has to do, including you. Believe it or not, every successful person in this world as jump. I'm going to tell you what I mean by that. You eventually, you are going to have to jump. You cannot just exist in this life. You have got to try to live. If you are waking up thinking that it's got to be more to your life than it is, man, believe that it is. Believe in your heart of hearts that it is. But to get to that life, you're going to have to jump.
I'll tell you why I call it jumping. See, God, when he created all of us, he gave every last one of us a gift at birth. He never created a soul without endowing them with a gift. You just got to quit looking at gifts as run and jump and sing and dance. It's more than that. It's if you know how to network, if you can connect dots, if you draw, if you teach. Some of y'all fry chicken better than anybody else. Bake pie. Some of you cut hair, color hair. Some people do grass. I got a partner, man. We never wanted to go out with us because we stayed out too late. Come on, man, go out with now. I got to get up early, mom. Cutting Miss Johnson grass. We kept laughing at this dude. Cutting grass. How much they pay you? He got a landscaping company in Cleveland worth $4 million. Because all he do is cut grass. But he was gifted at it. I got a partner on a detail shop, make $800,000 a year detailing cars. He got six mobile trucks running around. $800,000 a year. All he do is detail cars. That's his gift. That's what he loved to do. You've got to identify that gift. Now listen to me. When you see people in life, when you're standing on the cliff of life and you see people soaring by, when you see people soaring, going to exotic places, you hear about them doing wonderful things. Maybe you look up the street and your neighbor just gets a car every year, every two years. You know, how is he doing that? Have you ever thought, maybe this person right here has identified their gift and is living in their gift? Because your Bible says, this your Bible says, your gift will make room for you. Your gift. Not your education. You go get an education. That's nice. But if you don't use your gift, that education only going to take you so far. I know a lot of people got degrees, man. They ain't even using them. It's your gift. But the only way for you to soar is you got to jump. You got to take that gift that's packed away on your back. You got to jump off that cliff and pull that cord. That gift opens up and provides the soil. If you don't ever use it, you're going to just go to work. And if you're getting up going to work on a job every day that you hate going to, that ain't living, man. You just existed. At one point in time, you ought to see what living's like. But the only way to see what living's like, you got to jump. And here the problem. Let me just be real with you. When you first jump, let me tell you something. Your parachute will not open right away. I, I'm sorry. I, I wish I could tell you it did, but it don't. When you jump, it's not going to open right away. You're going to hit them rocks. You're going to get some skin tore off on them cliffs. You're going to get all your clothes tore off. You're going to get some cuts on you. You're going to be bleeding pretty bad. But eventually, Eventually, the parachute has to open. That is a promise of God. That ain't a theory. That's a promise. His promises is true. Because listen to me. You cannot name one single thing God has not gotten you through. Name it. And if he ain't got you through it, he currently pulling you through it right now. And the living proof of it is you sitting in here. If he hadn't got you through it, you wouldn't even be here. So if he ain't never not got you through it, why would he not let your parachute open? He, it has to open, man. But it, it, you got to jump, though. Now, here's another thing. You can play it safe and deal without the cuts and the tears. And you can stand on that cliff of life forever safe. But if you don't jump, I got another promise I can make. Your parachute will never open. You'll never know. You'll never know what God really has. See, your God has a wonderful life for you. Once again, I'm going to refer to your Bible. Now, you go down there, you memorize these scriptures, you're going to apply them to yourself. Your Bible says that he comes to give you life and give you life more abundantly. If I were you, I would jump. Because that's the only way to get to that abundant life. You got to jump, man.
You got to take a chance. Now, when I get through talking, there are those of you who have discussed this in the car. Well, I got bills. And I got, I got bills. I, whether you stay on the cliff or you jump, you're going to have bills. Well, if I quit my job, I'm going to ruin my credit. If you got a job, you live in check to check. Even if you got A1 credit, you can't buy nothing else no damn way. At one point in time, man, do yourself a favor. Go, go see what God really do. God hold you up, man. He ain't going to let you fall. He ain't bring you this far and let you fall. Do yourself a favor, man. Before you leave this world, before you die, jump. Just jump one time. Just jump. You have to take chances in life. If you don't take chances in life, you will never have the life God has for you. Life is about risk. If you play it safe in life, you ain't going to have much of a life. If you play it safe, you won't have much of a life. Life is risk. It take, it take courage to pursue your dream. I just did it. It cost me everything, but eventually, God is very good, man, when he sees you take a leap of faith. He supplies you everything you need. Now, it's gonna cost you something, but most people, most people, most people are not willing to pay what it costs to go after your dream, because you're gonna have to hurt a little bit. And most people don't like being uncomfortable. If you don't want to be uncomfortable, please do not pursue success because success is a very uncomfortable feeling. And I just learned to be, I learned to be comfortable being uncomfortable. If you can get that in your head, this too shall pass. Every moment of everything you've ever gone through, God got you through it. You didn't even realize it. He just got you through it. You can't name one thing he didn't pull you through. Well, I lost my mother. I'm still grieving over that. I lost my mama 21 years ago. I still grieve over it, but I'm here. You know, you, I got through it. You're going to get through it. But you got to take chance in life, man. Can't play it safe, y'all. Think about whatever it is that you have desired, whatever that you think that will give your life a sense of meaning and purpose and direction. Whatever you think will give you a sense of fulfillment. I just want you to think about this. I want you to think about this year coming up, this year that we're now in. I want you to look at the future, and I want you to think about what is it that, that will enable us to do that, and why is it that most people don't? I've had some tremendous breakthroughs. Many of you were here when I first came, over well, five years ago, pursuing a dream, working on creating and building and choosing a different kind of future. And it's always intrigued me what prevent most people from doing that. And, and when I first became intrigued at it and with it, it was at a point in my time when I was not where I wanted to be. I just felt at where I was at that point in time, it had to be more. I just, I was working at a job, wasn't going anywhere, I wasn't happy, and I wasn't making any money. Around payday, I would, I would get angry. Now, you seem like you would get happy when it's time for you to get paid. <laughs> but when I said, thank God, it's Friday, it wasn't because I felt good about getting paid. Because I knew before I even got that check, that money was already gone. It was already allocated. So I felt like I wasn't working for anything. And I said, there had to be more to life than this, just working every day and scuffling and getting up in the morning and going through the same changes every day and robbing Peter to pay Paul. Had to be more than that. Life was boring. And it, it seemed for a period of my life I was in a rut. And the heart I scuffled, the digger the hole I dug. Just, just kept on, just getting deeper. The harder I worked at trying to get out. I said it had to be more. And then I would see people on television doing things. And I said, well, I sure like to do that. And saw people enjoying themselves and enjoying a great life. I said, I sure like to do that. But something happened to me, ladies and gentlemen, that I think happened to a lot of people. I've had a major breakthrough. Over the next six weeks, I'm going to share with you some things that have worked for me. I'm not even asking you to believe me. I'm not asking you to agree with me. All I'm suggesting is... That as you look at your life, that as we begin to, to work and start building a strong launching pad, 
And this trail that I've been on, I said, if I can prove this with my life, I'm going to get a goal. I'm going to get a dream. I'm going to have a vision of myself that will take me out of my comfort zone. Something that as you look at it, somebody might say, that's impossible. You can't do that. But something that I like, I'm going to find me something that, that turns me on. See, at that point in time, I had not found my, my reason for being. I had not found the purpose of my life. And I had a very insecure feeling about myself. I, I didn't feel good about me. I didn't have the confidence that I wanted. And here's what I discovered, that when you don't have a grip on your purpose in life, when life doesn't have that, that special meaning and power for you, there is insecurity. But once you find your purpose, once you know why you showed up, and I believe all of us showed up to do something, everybody here, you showed up to do something. There's something that's going to be done by you and nobody else. That's what you showed up to do. And if you don't do it, we all will be deprived. Now, some of us know what our purpose is, and, and most of us don't consciously, but subconsciously, you know what it is. It's in you. You showed up with that in you. How do birds know how to fly from the north to the south during winter and no one ever gave them any navigational training or told them which way to go? How do they know how to do that? They showed up with it. I believe we got that in us. When you have an idea, when something comes into your imagination, that's not just your imagination. God places everything he has for you in your imagination. Albert Einstein said, imagination is everything. It's the preview to life's coming attractions. So when you have something in your imagination, it ain't hocus pocus. It's actually a preview of a coming attraction that God has for you. He places everything he has for you in your imagination. So if you've been dreaming of your own business, it's because that's what he got for you. If you've been dreaming of a summer home, it's because that's what he got for you. If you keep dreaming of a brand new car instead of a used car, it's because that's what he got for you. He places everything he has for you in your imagination. Imagination is everything. It's the preview to life's coming attractions. Everything in your imagination is God showing you in your mind something he has for you. You just got to, you can't tell it to everybody because because they ain't going to see. You know why you can't tell it to everybody? Because if you want to kill a big dream, tell it to a small-minded person. God has shown you some amazing stuff in your life that you thought was brilliant. Then you took it to your friends, friends and your family, and you shared it with them, and they shot it down. You know why they shot it down? Because they couldn't see it. You know why they couldn't see it? Because God didn't show it to them. He showed it to you. Your imagination is real, man. So when I imagine stuff, I act on it. Because he must want me to have it, or else he wouldn't have showed it to me. And then to quit worrying about how to get it done. The how-to is none of your business. God in the blessing business, man, you got to go with it. So when you have these things in your imagination, wake up and get into action. Stop, oh, well, I need to figure out. No, you, the Bible don't say figure nothing out. The Bible say ask, believe, receive. There ain't no stuff in the middle. Now, you got to be willing to work, but he don't require you to figure it out. The how-to is none of your business. That's all you got to know. Now let's summarize the ideas around using action to conquer fear and to build confidence and get moving towards success. First, be active, not passive. Strive to be someone who does things. Be a doer, not a donter. Don't wait until conditions are perfect to act. Conditions will never be perfect. Expect future obstacles and difficulties and solve them as they arise. Remember that ideas alone won't bring success. It's important to dream, but your ideas have value only when you act on them. Use action to cure fear and gain confidence. Do what you fear doing, and the fear of doing it disappears. Try it and see. Don't waste time getting ready to act. 
If you have trouble getting started, use the mechanical method to move your spirit. Don't wait for the spirit. We're talking about self-confidence and the things that help build it as well as the things that can destroy it. One of the major obstacles to building self-confidence is often your own memory. Lack of confidence is one result of what I call a mismanaged memory. Here's how a mismanaged memory works. Your brain is a lot like a bank. Every day you make thought deposits in your mind bank. And these thought deposits grow and become your memory. When you settle down to think or when you face a problem, in effect, you say to your memory bank, what do I already know about this? Your memory bank automatically answers and supplies you with bits of information relating to this situation that you've deposited on previous occasions. Your memory, then, is the basic supplier of raw material for your new thought. Now, the teller in this memory bank of yours is very reliable. He does exactly what you tell him to do. If you approach him and say, Mr. Teller, let me withdraw some thoughts I deposited in the past proving I'm inferior to just about everybody else, he'll say, right away, sir. Recall how you failed two times previously when you tried this? Recall what your sixth grade teacher told you about your inability to accomplish things? Recall what you overheard your fellow workers saying about you last week? And so on and so forth. This teller will continue digging out of your brain thought after thought that proves you're inadequate. But suppose you visit this memory teller and you give him this request. Mr. Teller, I face a difficult situation. Can you supply me with any thoughts that will give me reassurance? And again, the teller says, right away, sir. But this time, he delivers thoughts you deposited earlier that say you can succeed. Recall that excellent job you did in a similar situation before? Recall how much confidence Mr. Sawyer placed in you. Recall the respect your friends have given you for your abilities in this area, and so forth. Your teller lets you withdraw the thought deposits that you want to withdraw. After all, it's your bank. So there are two specific things you can do to build confidence through efficient management of your memory bank. First, deposit only positive thoughts in your memory bank. After all, everyone faces plenty of unpleasant, embarrassing, and discouraging situations. But unsuccessful and successful people deal with these situations in opposite ways. Unsuccessful people dwell on them and make them prominent in their memory. They don't take their minds away from them. At night, the unpleasant situation is often the last thing they think about. Successful people, on the other hand, don't give these situations another thought. Once they've gotten through them, they don't put them in the forefront of their memories. Quite the contrary, successful people specialize in putting positive thoughts into their memory banks. Imagine what would happen to your car's engine if you scooped up a handful of dirt every morning and put it into the crankcase. That engine would soon be a mess. It wouldn't be able to do what you wanted it to. Negative thoughts have the same effect on your mind and your confidence. They produce needless wear and tear on your mental motor. They put you on the side of the road while others drive ahead. So get in the habit of depositing positive thoughts into your memory bank. Just before you go to sleep, count your blessings. Recall the many good things you can be thankful for. Your family, your friends, your health. Recall the good things you saw people do today and the good things you heard them say. Recall your own personal victories and accomplishments, large and small. Go over the reasons why you're glad to be alive. The second thing you can do to build confidence through efficient management of your memory bank is to withdraw only positive thoughts from it. When you're alone with your thoughts, driving your car or having a quick lunch, or maybe on a business trip alone in the evening, don't dwell on whatever problems or troubles may be in your life at the moment. Remember instead the positive things, the good times you've had, the successes, the reasons that you're doing as well as you are. Mental health professionals tell us that some people create, in effect, their own private museums of mental horror by excluding positive thoughts from their memories and dwelling on negative ones to the point of obsession. These are obviously extreme cases, but many of us tip the balance to the negative in our memory banks, and that can often impede our personal progress. And whether the psychological problem is big or little, the cure comes when you learn to quit drawing negatives from your memory bank and draw positives instead. Don't build mental monsters. Refuse to withdraw unpleasant thoughts from your memory bank. When you remember situations of any kind, concentrate on the good part of the experience. Forget the bad. If you find yourself thinking about the negative side, turn your mind to something else. Take a nap, go for a bike ride, work in the yard. You don't need negative thoughts. You can live much better on a pure diet of positive ones. 
The encouraging thing that you'll discover if you practice these attitudes is that your mind will cooperate with you. Your mind really doesn't want the negative thoughts. If you ignore them, your teller will eventually cancel them out of your memory bank. One of the most common mental monsters we build is our impression of other people and how we measure up to them. People often fear other people. Why is it? Why do so many people feel self-conscious around other people? And what can we do about it? Fear of other people is a big, big fear. But there is one way to conquer it. You can overcome that fear if you learn to put people into proper perspective. I remember when I was inducted into the Army back in 1942. I was a very shy, confused young man, and I thought that everybody was bigger than I was, stronger, smarter, in every way superior to me. And, and my experience in the induction center really taught me something different. I saw maybe a thousand people come through there who were tall, skinny, smart, dumb. In any event, they were all just almost as confused as I was. In fact, in many cases, much more confused. So I started gaining a sense of worth about myself, realizing that the people that I'm are my peers are just as confused and just as scared as I am about this world that we're entering into. When this event became real is when you enrolled yourself. Before that, it was an idea. And there's lots of people who intended to be here, intended, but they never locked it in. So I lock it in advance, because if I hadn't locked it in after a date with Destiny, there's no way I would have gotten on a plane, flown all the way there, and then put myself in a room for seven days and nights. But I'm grateful I did. And I only did it because I already locked it in place. So I encourage you, number one, figure out at least twice a year, what are you going to go to that's going to make you grow and expand? How many of you feel like these last couple days have been some of the most growth you've had in a couple of days here? Say, ah! then why settle for this one time? Again, I'm happy to do it with you. I have other programs if you want to come, but you're not limited to me. I don't care where you go. But before you leave here, you should schedule what's next. Do you know why? Because how many were looking forward to this for a long time? I'm very excited about this. I'm curious. How many were quite scared about this shit? By the way, I'm curious. <laughs> but here's what's interesting. After you achieve a goal, have you ever done this? Worked your ass off, achieved a goal, and you feel good? And then there's kind of a drop because we need something compelling to be going after so we keep growing. So I always, right before I achieve a goal, I immediately set what the next thing is and I lock it into my schedule because otherwise there's that drop. And if I have the next thing, it's like you're going from peak to peak as opposed to peak to drop to peak to drop. How many follow I'm talking about here? Say I. And the other thing I've learned, I've taught this to all my children. And one time my daughter was talking to me, she's like, Dad, you know, you're so brilliant. And I said, you're absolutely right. <laughs> And I said, honey, you know, I am a smart human being. I've worked hard to be a smart human being, but probably my greatest gift is I do not let opportunity escape my grasp. If there's an opportunity and it scares me, if there's an opportunity and I don't have the time, if there's an opportunity and I don't have the money, in the early days of my life, all three of them, I didn't have time, the money, and I was fearful. I make myself do it because I know that if I don't get myself to do that, I'm not going to keep growing. My teacher, Jim Rohn, used to teach me this. He said, Tony, if you really want to have an amazing life, you got to learn to stretch yourself. I said, well, I do stretch myself. He goes, well, let me give you my philosophy of stretching. He said, stretching means if you find yourself saying, I can do something, then you must say, I must do it immediately and do it with no hesitancy. Because if you hesitate, it's like the firewalk. If you went up to the firewalk, most of you got up there, made your move and rock. Some of you get up there and like, fuck, 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 oh, shit, shit, oh, oh, what am I doing here? And the longer you wait, the what it is, harder it is. So you just train yourself to just do it. Instinctively push yourself. So if I say I can't, then I must. Now, when he first told me this, I said, well, if I can't, I must. If I can't jump off a cliff, then I must. He said, no, be intelligent. But he said, if you find yourself saying I can't do something, I don't want to do something, but you know if you made yourself do it, you're going to be a better human being, then you must do it. Don't hesitate, do it immediately. And so some people say, well, that's not a very safe life. That's not a very secure life. If you want security, go to prison. If you want freedom, this is how you live. So once you've got events where you're going to make huge growth, the next thing you want to do, throw it up to number two, is you really want to get yourself a coach or a mentor. Why do you want a coach or a mentor? You're smart. Well, I got a series of mentors. I've got three men in my life who are the smartest humans I know, some of the most successful people in the world in business, spiritually, emotionally well-developed. They're 18 to 20 years my senior. And guess what? I come to them all the time for accountability and feedback. Because as much as I know to drive myself, you don't do brain surgery on yourself even if you're a great brain surgeon. Does it make sense? You need some feedback from the outside because you're still in it. And so getting a coach is critical. Now I get paid a million dollars a year to coach someone and I only take on seven clients 
and I got now a five-year waiting list, so I'm not looking for any coaching clients, but I've trained all of my coaches to do the same things I do, and they don't charge a million dollars a year, not even close. So you can use our coaches if you want, or someone else, but what you don't want to do is have a friend be your coach. Why? I'll give you an example. Uh, a few years back, I was on this talk show that's in the morning, I won't mention the name, but it has a bunch of ladies, what's the name of it? The View. That's right, I won't mention it. And I was on The View, and it was when Barbara Walters was still on, and Barbara's a brilliant, amazing lady. And they had me on in January, and I was doing a piece on New Year, New Life, how to transform your energy and your body. And when I was done talking, it was a little seven-minute segment, all four, five women, I guess it was, five women followed me into the green room, literally, during the break. And they said, listen, before the TV comes back on, we want to do this. You know, tell us more, how are we going to do this? And we want to do this together. And when they said they want to do it together, I was like, hold it. I said, can, can I be direct with you on this? I said, Barbara, you know how much I respect you and all of you, but can I be direct? They said, well, yeah. I said, well, I respect you. You're some of the best in the world that you do as journalists. I said, you have an incredible show, number one of your show. You've been in the years. Barbara, you're a role model for anyone who wants to be successful, man or woman. But there's an area of your life none of you have mastered body. I'm not being harsh. I have to tell the truth because the truth is how you get to the things to change. And you should have seen him look around and be like, oh my God, he just said we're fat. I didn't say they're fat. I said, you haven't mastered this area of your life. And I said, here's the problem. If you guys get together now and none of you have mastered this area and you're all friends, you'll do this for two or three days. But about the third or fourth day in, one of you's going to go, I want to go to Starbucks and have a mocha, smoke a something, something, fuck, whatever that shit's called, right? And someone else can say, no, we got to work out. And they go, but look, can't we just stop for a few minutes? And then someone else will say, well, we can stop for a few minutes. And then you're fucked because you'll break the pattern. I said, have you ever done this before? And they started shaking their heads. They said, it's happened multiple times. I said, don't do this together. I know you love each other. That's why you shouldn't do it together. Get a professional. When you go, I want to smoke a smoke, they go, shut the fuck up and run! You need someone who's not going to listen to your bullshit and is going to push you until you develop the discipline, until you develop the skill. And even then, they're going to know the little things, the two millimeter things you don't know that could save you a decade. How many follow this? Say, I. So don't get a good coach, get an outstanding one. And the problem is I created the coaching industry. Before I came along, no one called himself a coach in this industry. There wasn't this industry. You got to be a therapist and you got to prove by insurance. And I came along and said, these therapists are sitting down with people for seven effing years and I can wipe out that phobia in 20 minutes or an hour. And so I went around and I said, I got to figure out who I am. I'm not a motivator. I never was. You know, I'm not a guru. What am I? And I thought, well, as an athlete, who influenced me the most were my coaches? And many of them were not as good as I was, but I'm in the game. I'm in the forest. They're outside of it. They could see things and give me cues, and they cared about me. So I said, that's what I am. Forget athletics. I'm a coach. I love people. I'm not better than they are, but I'm going to see things they can't see because this is my focus, right? And so I did that, and for many years, I called myself a coach. No one did, and I remember I was on Larry King Live, and I just started coaching President Clinton, and he goes, what is this coaching thing? You're not a coach. You don't coach athletes. I said, well, actually I do. But I said, no, here's what I mean by a coach. And I was about to give it up. And like within the next six months, everybody was a coach. Therapists started calling themselves coaches. Financial planners started calling themselves coaches. We became a term of art. Now I hate it. You know why? There's no standard, right? Anybody can say they'll call themselves a coach. Anybody go out there and do it. They go to some class. Some idiot teaches them three skills. They've never produced the fucking result in their life. And they're a coach. So I feel like I created a bastard industry. And so like any industry, there's good and bad. You got to find somebody who's outstanding. Don't settle for somebody who's good. And don't settle for somebody because you like them. Because liking them is a nice thing. You need somebody who has the skill to get you there. Who's with me on this? Say I. And why do we want a coach? So you measure at least twice a month, some of you three times a month. Because if you don't measure, you can't manage what you don't measure. Does that make sense? And you got to measure it. And it's easy with your children, with your life, with your businesses. You're going to get caught up. You need somebody helping you to stay on target for what you want for your life. How many follow? Say I. And it's cheap. Most coaching is inexpensive and the people that overcharge don't go to them. But get somebody who's really great. And then finally, thirdly, and this is what I want to show you this morning, you need a daily practice. And a daily practice that's going to put you in the best state possible regularly. And so there's two parts of the daily practice. One is you want to feed your mind every day for at least 30 minutes. And when I say feed your mind, my teacher Jim Rohn used to say, miss a meal, but don't miss reading for 30 minutes. And I don't mean reading the web or your social media bullshit or Twitter. I mean reading a real book that you've selected because it's going to make you grow spiritually, mentally, emotionally, financially. Something that makes you think, something that gives you a strategy, 
not some cute little blog post that you can read in five minutes. I mean something that's going to make you not be mental candy, something that's going to produce a different result. Because our lives are the result of the input. Input a bunch of garbage, you get garbage out. So I, I would like never miss reading. And then I started listening to audios when I was really young. And the great thing about audios is you can do what I call net time. No extra time. So the biggest challenge we have is when am I going to read? When am I going to do this? When am I going to do all these things? The answer is it doesn't take any extra time. If you use net time, you can do it while you're cleaning the house, while you're working out, going for a walk. When you're driving in your car, it should be your new university where you're feeding your mind. Because if you don't feed your mind, weeds grow automatically. You don't have to work on growing weeds. They're going to be there if you don't do something to replace it. So every day, 30 minutes of either audio or a book, something that's going to make you grow. It'll feed your mind. It'll keep the momentum going. So this won't be just the one burst. This will be the one that got you going. And then you keep the momentum by doing this. And then finally, and most importantly, many people, the most silly question I'm asked in the media all the time for 40 years is, don't you have bad days? Don't you get upset? Don't these things happen? Of course. But I said, I don't stay there. I've trained myself like an athlete trains their muscles. I've trained my emotional muscles, which by the way, I think your emotional and spiritual muscles are the most important ones. Encourage unused. Does it grow or shrink? Which one? Faith unemployed, unused. Does it grow or diminish? Diminishes. Passion unexpressed. Does it expand or shrink? So the most important muscles that change your life are those mental, emotional, spiritual muscles. If we develop them more, we're going to experience more. So the way I do that is through a process I call priming. And this is the part that I really want you to get because it's really simple. Most of us, have you ever thought, seen someone do something and thought to yourself, what the F is wrong with this idiot? Who's ever had that thought? How many of you have ever done something yourself and thought, what the F am I doing? <laughs> okay. Many times we think we're thinking our own thoughts when we're not. We've been primed by the environment to think a certain way and we don't even realize it. Now, sometimes that's done consciously by marketers or advertisers. That's a simplistic example. But a more powerful example is what happens in your daily life. So let me give you a couple examples so you become aware of the power of priming. And then I want to show you how you can consciously prime your own mind and body and emotion so you naturally go where you want to go as opposed to hoping you go there. So some of the studies on priming have shown that what you think are your thoughts actually got there because something in the environment that you're no longer noticing. So an example of this would be uh, they did a study and they took two actors and they both approached 100 people each and the actors were designed to do the exact same thing. They walk up to people, they have the same facial expression and they'd say, well, you're sitting there, excuse me, could you hold this for me for one second while I grab my phone? And they hand you this cup of coffee and then they reach in their pocket to get their phone for two seconds and they put it back real fast and they go, thank you so much and they take it back. And every time they did it exactly the same way with all the people, 200 people, 100 each. Each person did 100 people but 50 of those people they gave hot coffee to. 50 of the people they gave iced coffee to. Now listen to this. This is mind-boggling. After 35 to 45 minutes, roughly, a person walks by outdoors or at the mall, wherever they did this. They have a checkboard, you know, clipboard. And they go, excuse me, um, we'll give you $20 if you'll give us three minutes of your time to read these three paragraphs and answer two questions. 95% of people do it. 20 bucks, three minutes, I'll do it. And they read these three paragraphs, which is this story about this main protagonist. And then the two questions are, tell us what's the first emotion that you link to the main character and what's the second one? Those are the two questions. When they do this with people they had hot coffee to, 80% of the people, 81% to be exact, roughly 80, 81, say that the person they read the story about is generous and warm. Sometimes they have the word loving, but generous and warm is always there. The people who have the exact same presentation 34 or 40 minutes earlier were given iced coffee, 80%, there's a 1% difference, which is statistically irrelevant. 80% of them say the person is cold and uncaring. And the only difference is 35 or 40 minutes earlier, somebody handed you a hot or cold cup of coffee. That's wild, isn't it?